Okay. Uh, so let's just cancel this. All right. Uh, so nothing you see here has been like pre-recorded, pre-programmed, or anything like that. Uh, so like li all live events, uh, there's probably going to be some quirks, and we'll just try and work through them. Um, so let's see how we go. Um, so has anyone here been involved in the technical side of theatre before, uh, either sound or lighting? OK, a couple of people. Um, and how many people here know what DMX is? And I'm talking about the control protocol and not the wrapper. All right. Uh, so for the people who don't know, um, the first like couple of minutes are a, are a very quick uh, introduction to the entertainment lighting industry. Um, and so after the first like five minutes or so, you'll also know what DMX is uh, and the problems associated with it and sort of where we're going with this. Um, so to start off with, uh, we've got an outline. Um, what do I mean when I talk about entertainment lighting? Uh, so who here thinks the like, lighting in the room is entertaining? It's pretty much like static white light. Uh, if you're in an office every day, this is what you see. Uh, it's pretty good if you're trying to do a lecture theatre, uh, but otherwise like, it's fairly boring to look at. So entertainment lighting, on the other hand, is the type of lighting that you'll find in these sorts of venues. Um, so on the very small end, uh, you've got like maybe your restaurants, uh, your clubs, theatres, uh, and then scaling up to stadiums, theme parks, cruise ships, that sort of scale. Um, the lights are normally very dynamic, so they're turning on and off, they're changing colour, they're changing pattern, they're moving around at the same time. Um, so it's much more interesting and visually, appear uh, visually appealing to look at. Um, of course, because of this, it requires a control system. So to dive into the history of it, uh, if we go back to the 1800s, uh, typically the only venues at the time were theatres, and you had things like candle, oil lamps, uh, lime lights, and gas lamps. So the device up the top here is an oil lamp. Uh, you flip the little thing up, you pour your oil in, light the wick in there, uh, and it gives you a little bit of light. And typically you put these down the stage, down the front of the stage in the theatre, um, and then you have someone to you know, top up the oil and blow them out when the scene changes. The device over here is more interesting. It's a lime light. Um, so the two spouts you see here are where you connect your oxygen and hydrogen lines. Um, and then you have an operator that stands behind here uh, that makes sure the gas mixture is OK. And over the flame inside, uh, you put quicklime or calcium oxide. Um, quicklime has a very high melting point. Uh, and so when you bring it up to a high temperature, it produces a very bright white light. Um, so you've got your operator standing behind here. Uh, they're fairly difficult to operate. You've got to get your mixtures just right. If you go too fast, you like, use all your quicklime. If you go too slow, you probably burn your flame out, and then the person on stage plunges into darkness. Um, the sort of common thing amongst all of these uh, is they all require people standing very close by to operate. Um, and so there's not much you can do from a control system point of view, uh, maybe besides like pulling the gas lines at the end of the show. So that sort of continued through the 1800s uh, and the early part of the 20th century. And then things really started changing uh, when electricity started being used more. And so uh, you can see systems here from the 60s. Um, over on the left here, uh, we have a 60-channel uh, control desk. And on the right here, we have a 20-channel dimmer. Um, to give you an idea, this is about the size of a like, full-size rack in a data center. So it's taller than a human uh, and probably like this wide or so. And you've got an operator there. Uh, each one of these is a channel. Uh, so by uh, moving this up and down, uh, the operator controls the intensity of a single light. Um, so 60 channels, 60 lights, uh, connected to a 20-channel dimmer. So you have three of those stacked up down the back of the theater somewhere. Um, and that's how the first sort of like remote control lighting was done. Um, now, the problem with this system uh, is that it's all analog control. So typically, the control signal is 0 to 10 volts. Uh, so you have massive thick cables, even for a relatively few number of channels, uh, running from the back of the theater down the front. Um, some of the very earlier desks uh, were actually live control, and you can imagine the sort of problems associated with that because you're switching very high voltages. Yeah, not so fun. Um, so these are the analog control desks, um, and that continued for a while. And you know, 60 channels was great in like your sort of theaters of the day. Um, but then people wanted more and more channels as they wanted more and more lights. So in 1986, uh, a bunch of electronic engineers got together. Uh, sat down in a pub and created the DMX standard, which is digital multiplexing. Um, so it uses a serial link, um, an RS-485 link, and then it sends frames of data down the link um, at various speeds. It's normally about 40 frames a second because that's you know, enough to make the human eye think that it's smooth. So it's sending these frames uh, of 512 bytes each. They're variable length, but you can go up to 512 bytes. 
Um, and then you chain your devices together. Um, and so you've got your control desk on the left. Uh, it's typically sent down a five core cable. Um, I've got one of them here running from this control desk across to the lights. And it sends this repeatedly. Um, and the encoding is pretty simple as well. Um, you've just got a break, which triggers the start of the frame. You've got a start code, uh, which is a single byte that basically says, you know, zero is actual DMX data. Um, and then you've got a repeated series of bytes. So to go through an example, um, we've got a control desk here, a very simple four channel dimmer on the right here, uh, and then four colored lights up the top there. So if we go uh, left to right, the blue light would be channel one, red light would be channel two, uh, yellow and green and so on. So if our control operator wants to set blue at 50% and red at 40%, um, the desk here would send you know, a frame with a start code of zero with a hex data of 7F and then 6.6. Uh, the dimmer would look at this frame uh, take the first two or take the first four bytes of it um, and then change its outputs appropriately uh, and those would control the colored lights. Um, now the important bit here is that these devices are, on the end of these chains have start addresses. Um, they're normally set by little dip switches. Some of the new modern devices have like an LCD panel or something on them. And that tells the device the first channel of data that it should listen to. So in our example here, the start address is one because we wanted to listen from the first uh, byte in the frame. Um, but say we had like a bunch of these, you know, the first one would have a start address of one, the second one would have a start address of five, and so on. So you can chain devices together like that. So that worked well, um, because when DMX was created, you know, everyone thought that no one would have more than 512 channels. Um, but lighting designers kept on, you know, wanting more things, uh, and technology kept on marching forward. And so this is what we have today. Um, this is a sort of mid-range uh, automated light, uh, it's called a Max 700. Um, you can see all the attributes here that we can vary on the light. So we can move it around. We can do color mixing. So CMY is your uh, cyan, magenta, yellow. So you can create any, any color you want, really. You've got strobes, uh, animation wheels, if you want to do like wave effects or flames, those type of things, iris, zoom, focus, prism. Um, and like I said, this is a sort of mid-range one. Um, so this one here takes 31 DMX channels to control. Um, some of the more high-end lights that are right out there now uh, take over 170. I think the most I've seen is about 210 or so. Um, so now we've gone sort of from the analog world where you had to run one conductor per light uh, to the digital world, um, and now we're sort of back into the same problem uh, where you know you may get a couple of these per DMX universe, otherwise you're back to running cables per, per light. Uh, so to give you a demo of how this maps, um, so I have two of the automated fixtures here. Um, this one is a Mac 101, this one is a Mac 250. They're sort of the, the cousins to the one that I had on screen there. Uh, so what we can do is, uh, on the control desk, we can start toggling channels. Um, so shutter strobe is the first channel, um, which I've got set so the light actually comes on. Um, so we can bring up the dimmer, uh, and now we're controlling it. Ooh, let's get rid of that. All right. So now we've got a dimmer. Um, now we can select our color. Uh, they shouldn't be flashing. Yeah. Is everyone okay? Or I'm not going to try and flash them. That's not the plan. Uh, and now we have an interesting case of why this is not working correctly. Anyway, let's take that down. All right. So we can bring up a color here. Um, Right, we've got some weird artifact going on there. Um, sorry? Yeah, I'm not sure. I think that one's just reset its start address. I will have to try and fix that. Um, so if we focus on that one for a minute. Um, so I can use the third channel then to uh, select the color on it. Um, on the fourth channel, so let's say we go with green or blue. That'll do. Um, we can use the next channel here to select a pattern. Uh, so let's pull in this one. Um, finally, we can index the pattern, uh, so we can either have continuous rotation or we can set the angle that we'd like. Um, we have focus, uh, which I've already done, um, and then we can bring in prism effects as well. Uh, and so you can create fancy looking patterns like this. Um, and then finally, we've got pan and tilt, uh, so now we can actually start moving the light around the room. Um, and they look really good uh, once you get a bit of haze in the air and you can actually see the beams and that sort of thing. Uh, all right. So that was the channel mapping for the 250. Um, for the 101, which seems to be having problems right now, 
Take all of that off. Okay, no, I think it's reset its start address. Oh, there we go, now it's gonna reset itself. All right, so that one's having problems. That's all, all part of the live demo. Um, so you can see that they're really quite versatile devices and lighting designers really love them because you can replace like large numbers of conventional lights um, with a couple of these. Um, so the use sort of like started ramping up fairly, fairly uh, largely in the industry. Um, and then you get to events like this. So this was the London 2012 Olympics. Um, it used about 3,500 of these automated lights, uh, plus a whole bunch of other conventional fixtures, um, plus the world's largest uh, LED screen because they had everyone in the audience holding a nine, uh, three by three pixel uh, controller, which they then did pixel mapping on. Um, so you can just imagine the sort of number of channels that are required to control an event this size um, and how running, you know, a thousand DMX cables out there across a, a venue the size of, you know, the London Arena um, isn't a super scalable solution. Um, so the solution, you know, is fairly obvious to software engineers. Uh, you know, you've got this nice serial link. What did everyone else in the world do when they were faced with this problem? Uh, they moved to an IP-based protocol. Uh, so the industry uh, sort of figured this out in the late 90s um, as events started getting larger and larger. Um, that was the good part of it. The bad part is that every manufacturer out there went and developed their own. Um, and so you ended up with like a whole slew of different protocols. Of course, none of them talked to each other. Um, and then you had a sort of fight throughout the 2000s as to who was going to dominate. Um, so in the mid-2000s or so, um, the Plaza Standards Board, which, so Plaza is the entertainment organization, uh, they finally got together and released an ANSI standard for DMX over IP, which is called Streaming ACN. Um, and then after that, you sort of saw a, uh, a slow death of the rest of the protocols. Um, so most of these are, are gone now. Artnet remains out there quite a bit. Um, and ETCnet is, is still used quite a bit as well. But the others are, the others are sort of mostly, mostly dying off at this point. Um, so it was sort of against this backdrop um, that the open lighting architecture was born. Um, so it started as a, a university project here at UWA. Um, and then as uh, we sort of released the code, we found more and more people wanting to you know, convert protocol A to control, uh, protocol B, or doing you know, protocol A to uh, straight DMX, so they could build uh, IP to serial gateways. Um, so you can see it supports seven of the DMX over IP protocols. Um, maybe about four of them or so have public uh, specs out for. The rest of them were reverse engineered. Um, it supports a whole lot of DMX devices. Um, so those are the USB style devices that you see here. So it's USB in one end and DMX out the other. Um, we have APIs for various languages. Uh, it runs on a bunch of platforms. Um, but more importantly um, is that it gives us a framework that we can experiment and build the sort of next generation of lighting control protocols on. Um, so as you'll see towards the end of this talk, um, we've sort of gone just beyond DMX and DMX over IP um, to a sort of whole richer family of protocols. Um, and we really need a way to prototype these before we push them through the standards process. So just briefly on the design of things, um, the dotted lines here are the process boundaries. Um, so this is OLAD, the, the daemon that runs there. Um, it has a bunch of plugins. Every plugin is responsible for, you know, either it's a network protocol plugin uh, or it's responsible for a class of hardware. Uh, so these could be USB devices or SPI buses, which we'll see in a minute. Um, and then you have these other programs uh, which use the APIs to talk to uh, the core controller. Um, and so you can write client programs to generate the DMX data uh, and then send it out through whichever mechanism you like. Um, the sort of important point here, point here is that uh, OLA itself doesn't generate DMX data. Uh, that's left to someone else. Um, so we don't try and generate the data that's going to produce the pretty patterns or change the colors or anything like that. Um, we're just a transport mechanism. Uh, it also has a web server where you can configure it. Uh, it registers itself in DNSSD, so you can find it easily on the network, uh, that sort of thing. All right, so onto the applications. Um, so there's three main applications that I wanted to talk about today. Um, so the first is using OLA as a backend for a lighting control console. Um, so as the technology sort of gets more advanced, um, there's really a transition happening um, between sort of consoles like this, which were, you know, like, fairly simple embedded systems uh, up to much more complicated consoles which typically just run uh, Linux or some other OS inside them um, and have much sure. Uh, yep? For those who have the same point, can you um, hold it up for sure? Okay. Uh, hopefully without resetting anything. Uh, so on here, these faders each control a channel. Uh, I'm not on that one anymore. So this here, that's my second channel. 
uh, and pan should be here somewhere, so I can move it around. Um, so this is a fairly simple console. Um, you can see it's only got uh, like 16 faders, and you can sort of you do soft patching. Um, I think it controls up to uh, 20 of these lights, um, but it's fairly restricted in what it can do. And how much might something like that cost? Uh, so the industry is really expensive. This is part of the problem. Um, I would probably say like uh, entry level, like one or two thousand um, dollars. Your massive consoles are probably a hundred grand or so. The ones that are use, getting used on Olympic style events, and you have uh, you know banks of them for redundancy and all the rest of it. So it gets very expensive fast. Um, so there's a move on right now um, because, of course, no one wants to, you know, most, most hobbyists don't want to drop that sort of money. Um, so there's a move on to build more software controllers. Um, and the nice thing about software controller, of course, you can run it on your laptop. You can buy, say, like a MIDI wing, hook it up over USB, so that will give you a couple of faders. Um, and then you can do DMX over Ethernet uh, and build, you know, build or buy a DMX gateway. Um, and so you can get into the market for uh, much cheaper than it costs to go and purchase something. And you get, you know, a nice display and all the rest of it. Um, so OLA is really good at being used as a backend for this um, because the console, manuf or console writers themselves um, don't want to go and support every uh, you know, different USB device out there uh, and re-implement all the protocols and everything like that. Um, so these are at least two uh, lighting consoles that are using this. Uh, QLC Plus is a GPL console. Um, it's surprisingly good. Um, it was done by a guy at the uh, University of Helsinki, I think, um, and then someone else has taken over maintenance of it now. Um, so it'll do all the sort of moving lights. You can generate patterns and colors and do uh, like shapes and everything else with it. Uh, D-Light is commercial software, uh, which also uses the OLA uh, client libraries uh, and uses OLA as its back end. Um, so the second application uh, is as an SPI controller. Um, so this was sort of like unheard of um, about maybe two years ago, and then the Raspberry Pi came out. Um, and of course, the Raspberry Pi has an SPI output, um, and our software is really useful because, you know, we already implement the DMX over IP protocols, and so we just added an SPI plugin, and now you can control the pixel walls. Um, so this has seen uh, sort of a, a lot of use in the last year, um, and people are making all sorts of, like, cool projects based on this. So off to another demo. Um, so what we're going to do now um, is control this uh, 8x8 pixel matrix um, using... Uh, OLA running on both the Raspberry Pi and on my laptop here, um, and we're going to send DMX over IP. So I've got an Ethernet cable running between the two. So this is what the hardware looks like. Uh, if we go to the sort of software logical diagram, this is what we're going to do. So we have a Python script. We're going to call into the Python API, um, which is going to talk to OLA. OLA is going to translate that DMX uh, that Python is generating, uh, send that over Ethernet. Uh, across to the Raspberry Pi, where a second instance of OLA is running. We're going to take that DMX data, uh, spit it out over the SPI bus, uh, and hopefully control these things correctly. So this is the sort of simplest Python uh, that will do something interesting. Um, so just stepping through this for a moment, we do our usual imports. Um, we set up a tick interval, which is the frequency that we're going to spit out new DMX data. Um, we have a function, send DMX frame. Uh, we just generate an array of data. Um, so here we have an 8x8 matrix, so we need 64 of them. Um, the pixels are RGB, so they take three channels each, red, green, and blue. And so we're just going to uh, gradually fade up on the red, which is the first channel. Uh, the rest of them will remain zero. Um, so we create this array of data, uh, we send it using the client, and then we just you know, add another event to call ourselves in 100 milliseconds. Um, so let's try this. So this is my script. And hopefully, all right. OK. So like I said, this is generating the data off my laptop, sending it using uh, streaming ACN, um, which is the sort of ANSI standard now for DMX over IP, uh, across to the Raspberry Pi. If we look at the configuration of each of these, so this is the web UI for OLA actually running on my laptop. Um, we've got two universes here. Uh, universe is mapped to a sort of physical line of DMX, uh, so 512 channels in the, the old world, it was the actual wire. If we go and inspect this universe, um, you can see that we have no input ports because we're getting the data straight from the client itself, um, and we're sending the DMX data out over uh, streaming ACN. If we look at the other one running on the Pi, 
uh, we've got an input port with streaming ACN, uh, and then sending out on an SPI device, um, and we specify the sort of the format of the pixels because you can get different driver chips for these, um, and the number of pixels and that sort of thing. Um, and just to convince you that you can actually control all of them, uh, this is the game of life running uh, on an 8x8 matrix. Um, the colors here relate to the age of the cells. It just makes uh, very interesting patterns. Let's cancel that. Okay, so the third application that I wanted to talk about um, was using DMX as a gateway. Oh, sorry, using OLA as a gateway. Um, and so, as I said, as more people move to the software-based controllers, um, there's this real need for like very low-cost DMX gateway solutions in the industry. Um, so all the manufacturers that built their own or designed their own protocols uh, came out with their own gateways. Uh, they typically charge like about thousand dollars and up uh, for a device that's you know reading like very simple UDP packets uh, off Ethernet and then spitting them out the serial port. So you can do this with Raspberry Pis and BeagleBone Blacks and everything else. Um, so you can run OLA in this mode, plug in a USB dongle uh, like I have here. Um, this is sort of at the high end of the market. Um, these sell for about $500 each. Uh, at the very low end, you can pick up uh, DMX, USB DMX dongles for about $50 uh, from companies in both Australia and New Zealand. Um, so a lot of people uh, you know, that don't want to pay the $1,000 uh, are building their own uh, using these systems. Uh, and there's a couple of people um, which are sort of like looking at doing this commercially uh, because they can get the cost down. And so this is what it looks like, sort of in the hardware point of view. Uh, you have a control console that spits out DMX over Ethernet. Uh, this one doesn't because it's sort of a, a lower and cheaper version, but the newer ones do. Um, and then you can hook that up to a Raspberry Pi, feed it through a USB DMX device, and then into your uh, devices. Um, and I was going to try and control one. Uh, all right, let's see if this is actually going to work. Uh, I don't know how to, I'm afraid. No? Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh. Okay. Um, so if we go here, let's see if this is going to work for me. Nope, apparently not. Sorry, I think that light is having difficulty. I could. OK, um, so on to the sort of applications and where it's used. Um, so popular installations, um, a lot of uh, sort of artists decide to use it. Um, something about, you know, like artists probably don't have a lot of funding. They tend to go for like very cheap uh, open source solutions. Um, so this is an art gallery in Kansas City. Uh, there's a wall with all these panels. Uh, I'm not quite sure like what the artist was going for, but the sort of LEDs dance behind and, and produce pretty patterns. Um, this is on a building in Germany, uh, again like SPI, uh, SPI using to control pixel strings, uh, and it does like fancy lighting and all the rest of it. And it's also controlled by OLA with a Raspberry Pi sitting behind it. Uh, onto the sort of larger ones, uh, this is a dome uh, which is probably about I don't know maybe 25 feet tall or so. Um, along all of the edges here, uh, they have LED strips, uh, and so they do really fancy patterns and project across the dome and that sort of thing. Uh, that is at the uh, Oregon Fair uh, up in the US. Uh, and then finally, this is a club in Italy, uh, which is using OLA to do the pixel mapping uh, across these LED screens on stage. Uh, so those are the four, the four instances that I could come up with quickly. Um, so we've sort of seen how uh, we can use OLA to generate data uh, and then control lights. Um, the other interesting part of this is actually receiving DMX data and using that to trigger interesting things on stage. So as part of the framework, we have this pro program called uh, OLA DMX Trigger, um, and you can define a config file, uh, and then based on the DMX values it receives, it goes and execs uh, other programs. Um, so you can, do this all, you can use this to do all sorts of fancy things, um, like, you know, uh, toggle presentations and just general GPIO pins on the Pi to do like solenoids or uh, relays or that sort of thing. 
Um, and so this is an example here of uh, using DMX to set the volume uh, playback on a Raspberry Pi or another computer or something like that. Um, so these USB devices uh, that I have here, uh, many of them can be put into DMX receive mode. Um, and so you can plug them in just like any other D, uh, DMX device in a network, in a, a daisy chain, uh, and use that to receive DMX and then toggle all sorts of uh, cool behavior based on that. Um, so onto the new style of things. Um, so I've talked about DMX. Um, the big problem with DMX uh, is that it's unidirectional. Um, so the controller just sits there, sit, like spitting out data every 40 frames per second, um, and doesn't really get any feedback as to whether the things that it's sending to uh, even exist, right? Uh, if someone went and unplugged all of the lights, um, the controller wouldn't know that at all. Um, RDM adds uh, bidirectional control uh, to the RS-485 line. Um, so what the consoles can do now um, is query the devices out there and say, you know, tell me about yourself, uh, tell me what your fan speeds are, your temperature settings, how long your bulb's been on, um, because, you know, bulb life, life is an issue in this. Um, and then the big thing, the sort of killer feature for the industry uh, is that you can set the DMX start address remotely. Um, so if you imagine that you have, uh, you know, 20 or 30 of these, um, and you connect them to the trussing and the, that you fly the trussing up in the air, um, and then someone on the ground uh, has forgotten to set the start address using the little dip switches on one of those lights, uh, it means that you have to get the guy out with the ladder or you have to pull the whole truss down, and by that time, you know, the band's probably on stage trying to do their sound check and it's, it's just chaotic. So what you can do is with the newer controllers, um, you can actually say, you know, identify the device, um, and then you can find the one you're after and set the start address. Um, and you can also, like I said, do all the monitoring um, and alert if devices get pulled out. Um, so this is particularly useful for um, venues like museums and theme parks um, because you can sit in one large control room um, and if someone pulls the, uh, you know, trips over the cable or pulls the power off a device, uh, you can get immediate notification of that uh, and then schedule it for your maintenance run. Uh, so I was going to try and do a demo of RDM. Sorry. Yeah, don't worry. You go ahead. Yeah. All right. So on Universe 2 here, um, this is the one uh, that's connected to this USB device. Um, like I said, this one's a bit more expensive. One, one of the big reasons why is because it does RDM. Um, and so this device here, uh, the Mac 101, um, is one of the newer fixtures, and so it supports RDM. So we can go to the RDM tab here. Um, we can see that we've discovered this device. Um, and now what we can do is, you know, say I'm, I'm sitting in the back in the control room. Uh, I don't know which one of the 30 lights this is. Um, I can throw it into identify mode. Um, and it will move up and, and visually identify itself. Um, and now that I've got it doing that, um, I can go and configure the start address. Uh, I can change the personality. Um, so this is sort of a, a way of changing how the device responds. Um, and often it uh, changes how many channels it takes. And I can do other things like change the way it moves, um, get information about it, what firmware it's running, um, that sort of thing. Um, so RDM, really the manufacturers are free to implement like sort of as much of the standard as they want. Um, there's just a series of messages, a very few of them are required, and then they can sort of like differentiate themselves based on how many of these uh, new messages that they implement. Uh, so let's get back here. So in terms of what's coming next uh, for OLA, um, the big thing that we really need to work on is a Windows port. Um, and being a Linux conference, people are like, why you even bother targeting uh, Windows? Um, it's actually really important for us because a lot of the console manufacturers uh, won't move to our software until they can do it on all platforms. Um, and so a lot of the console manufacturers are sitting there saying, you know, like, we'd love to use your stuff, but right now we can only use it on, uh, you know, Linux and Mac. Uh, and because of that, we're not willing to throw away our entire framework. Um, so this has sort of been a, a high priority for us for like the last year or so. Um, we're lacking uh, decent Windows programmers, uh, so it hasn't really, hasn't really moved much. Um, Android is another one uh, that we've been trying to target for the last six months or so. Uh, it's mostly there. We just need to clean up a couple of things. Um, we need to build a proper RESTful API. Um, so right now there is a uh, JSON API. It's not like RESTful in the, the sort of strict sense of the word. Uh, so we planning on standardizing that uh, and publishing the API and everything else for it. Um, then in terms of like more complex things, um, we have this sort of plan to do what's called patch of E2. 
Um, so right now in OLA, you can really only connect uh, input ports to output ports, um, and that just sort of maps the uh, DMX universe straight through between the two of them. Um, Patcher V2 would allow us to insert filters in between that, and so you can start munging the DMX values and do all sorts of fancy things. Um, so you could say, you know, I want to cap this particular range of channels to 50% because I don't want all these lights going up all the time. Um, I want to offset and shift these channels. Uh, I want to, you know, trigger this one channel based on the value of another or things like that. Um, so it'll be a much more flexible system, um, but of course we need to design that and work through. Um, there's one commercial, uh, commercial manufacturer out there that does something like this. Um, so there is a bit of a demand from the industry. So we're going to try and, uh, try and pr pr produce an open source version of that. Um, and then finally, uh, there's this thing called RDMNet. Um, so just like we have DMX over IP with streaming ACN, um, the next logical step is to do RDM over IP, um, which is what RDM is. Um, but the big sort of problem here, uh, or, or reason why it's taking so long, um, is because we really want to solve the multi-controller problem. Um, so you can imagine in very large venues, uh, you have someone down the front of the theater with their console trying to like, you know, focus the lights, and then you've got someone else up in the back of the theater, and maybe you've got like a couple of wall panels. Um, and we're trying to work around the sort of normal uh, like control authority and mediation side of things to make sure that those uh, views presented to the users are in sync um, and you know, we don't have users fighting for things. Whoa. Um, and yes, we've done uh, GSOC, which is the Google Summer of Code for the last two years. Uh, we'll probably be looking for students again in 2014. Um, so finally, just to finish up, um, like I sort of mentioned, um, historically, uh, the lighting hardware in the industry has varied from expensive to extremely expensive if you're trying to do custom work. Um, so you can buy these sort of things. Uh, if you're trying to do something like, you know, the chandelier that flies in over Phantom of the Opera, uh, you can just start adding zeros to it, basically, right? Um, and like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, that sort of thing. Um, so a lot of this now is moving towards, uh, you know, very low cost uh, embedded Linux platforms, uh, often running OLA uh, because it's so sort of customizable and we give people the, the ability to do whatever they want with it. Um, and just to show you how far we've come in the last couple of years, um, this is a product called the Mini-Me, uh, made by uh, Roby, which is sort of a competitor to the company that makes these. Um, and, you know, the difference between, I guess, this one and here, they're both about the same size. Um, but this one's really cool because it's not just a moving light, it's actually got a mini projector in it. Um, so you can project, uh, I think it's Super VGA video, uh, and you, you plug your video input in, uh, and then you can move that video around the room and do, like, proper keystoning and everything else. Um, this has just come out in the last, like, six months or so. Um, and the really cool bit is that if you read closely on the specs, they actually advertise that they're building it on a Raspberry Pi uh, running Linux. All right, so that's kind of it. Um, there's more information there. Uh, we're on IRC if you want to chat to people. Um, we also are happy to help out lighting designers or just generally people in the industry. Um, we get people jumping in there all the time just asking general like DMX over Ethernet or RDM questions. Uh, and there's code for the get demos pushed up onto GitHub. All right, any questions? Sure. Just, uh, oh, okay. Good. Sorry? I'll just repeat them, sorry. Yeah. Um, just wondering how you change the address on the device that you don't know the address of to start with. Uh, so you can't remotely. Okay. Well, so, well, so. When you just said it discovers the device, then you can set its address. Mm hmm. Oh, so if we cut back to here. Oh, sorry. So the question was, uh, how do you change the address, the DMX start address, on a device that you don't know the address of in the first place? Um, and so the answer is that all the, uh, all the fixtures come with a unique identifier. So that's what you can see over in this bit here. Uh, so it's uh, typically a manufacturer code. Uh, yeah, so it's very similar to a MAC address. And so when you do the discovery process, you'll enumerate all the, uh, all the unique identifiers on the, on the line. Uh, yep. Not professionally, I don't think. No. So the question was, uh, do any manufacturers uh, control this style of lighting through power lines? Uh, not that I know of. Um, typically, they want to isolate their networks from everyone else in the venue. Um, there's even sort of big fights about getting on the same uh, Ethernet networks as, uh, as you know, sound and, and venue management and all the rest of it. Um, there's quite a few manufacturers, well, quite a few, I guess uh, probably three in the industry, um, which are doing wireless DMX now, um, and that sort of has its own own set of challenges. Yep. What does this mean for um, proprietary lighting and remote controls to provide DMX across from 
Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so the question is, what does this mean for proprietary controllers uh, like Crestron and AMX, uh, which are two standards that I didn't cover that sort of, uh, AMX at least was sort of a precursor to DMX. Um, I guess you could build a uh, like DMX to AMX gateway out of this. Um, I'm not sure anyone has. Um, I haven't seen those protocols getting used. Uh, I'm not uh, in venues like legacy venues so much. Uh, I only re really deal with the new stuff. Um, but there's certainly companies out there that sort of very small companies that their bread and butter is making old systems work, right? Like those, the dimmers that we saw there, um, there's a, still like a couple of that vintage like around the world, right? And people go in there and repair them uh, because they claim that they're more reliable than the, the stuff you buy nowadays. Yep. Uh, so the question was, was there any open hardware projects? Um, not that I know of. When the Raspberry Pi came out, uh, pretty much every couple of weeks there would someone, be someone who jumped into the RFC room <coughs> and would be like, hey, you know, I'm going to build a, uh, an open source DMX shield for it. Um, typically what they find is that that's like non-trivial um, and then, you know, they work on that and then sort of disappear after a while. Um, I know one company that has built a shield for the Beagle Bones. Um, they don't sell the shield themselves. They uh, build devices and uh, install those into venues. Uh, so I don't think you can buy those. Um, the only thing, I guess, the closest thing to open hardware would be the NTEC Open USB box, um, which came out, I guess, probably over a decade ago. Um, it's a very, very simple USB to DMX using a FTDI converter chip. Um, the problem with the device is that uh, it doesn't do any of the timing on board, so it relies on the host, piece, uh, host PC to get the timing right. Um, and so as soon as you throw any load on the host PC, uh, your DMX timing goes out the window. Um, but yeah, that was sort of Intec's uh, first attempt at like, an open hardware product. Uh, it didn't go too well because a bunch of people ripped them off, I guess, as much you can rip off an open project, uh, and they sort of got a bad taste in their mouth about it. And no, I don't think anyone else has really tried anything since then. Okay. So on the Raspberry Pi, is it written in Python or C or? Uh, so the core of it's written in C++. Um, and then yes, you can talk to it via a Python API. Uh, so the question was whether it's written in Python or, or something else. And so to install it? Uh, on Raspbian, uh, you just add the uh, repo and do an apt-get install OLA. Um, we do images as well. Um, if you look on the website, there's a, like a stripped down Raspbian image uh, which has it all preloaded. Um, and you simply just throw that in and it starts working. Okay. So we've gone from, you know, strand parallel to TL serial to DMX and now we've, we're going to Ethernet. Is the, and, and that's really kind of taking a serial protocol and melding it into an Ethernet protocol, is there something else on the horizon? Are there people working toward, you know, what is next or are we kind of stuck on DMX? Because what makes me ask that is you've got the like RMD, which gets rid of the, the universe problem in its entirety. Uh, it strikes me that with Ethernet, we shouldn't have that problem anymore. Okay, so the question is uh, why, I guess if I paraphrase, uh, why are we continuing to build on a system that has been around for like 30 years? Uh, why don't we reinvent it for sort of the modern era? So, so aware of yes. So, so back in the early 2000s, and I'll, I'll try and not show my bias here. Back in the early 2000s, when people realised uh, that they had to go to DMX over IP, um, before they tried to standardise a DMX over IP protocol, um, they built something, <sighs> some uh, very very complicated protocol that uses XML and all sorts of other glorious things. Uh, what they try to do is abstract the concept of a light. So rather than have a fixture, uh, you had a device that output uh, photons, essentially, according to the protocol. Uh, and then you had a bunch of attributes, like you know, how many photons it outputs, and what, you know, what colors it outputs, and the, the angles that it's talking, and everything else. And so you, you end up with this like, very nice, long XML document <laughs> describing your fixture. Um, and then you have a protocol that tries to implement reliable multicast uh, to like, synchronize all of the uh, devices out there on the network. Um, so the protocol that I'm talking about is ACN, uh, which is Architecture Con for Control Networks. Uh, it took over a decade, I believe, to develop. 
uh, it was so complicated that there's only one company out there in the world that implements it correctly. Well, and maybe not even correctly, just implements it full stop, right? Um, and so there's this ongoing uh, discussion, or heated discussion, uh, between the sort of the DMX RDM guys and the ACN guys. Um, some of that's coming through in RDM net because there's a, a sort of a, a pull towards like, hey, you know, well, this is sort of solved with ACN. Why don't we just move RDM net in that direction? Um, and all of this sort of like actual programmers who like things to work are just like, no, no, we just want to keep things simple. Um, so yes, there is the protocol out there that will allow you to do this. Um, no, it's not very widely used within the industry. Um, and I don't really see that changing. Uh, so the question was asking about a, uh, a bit of software developed for the Arduinos, uh, which drives SPI uh, based on, on SPI. oh, sorry, not SPI? Okay. 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 All right. Um, I guess but the important bit is that you, you control it using UDP packets. Um, so certainly you could write a plugin to do that, right, that you could spit out the UDP packets. Um, there's actually a project that sort of comes under the, the open lighting umbrella, um, which is the Arduino RGB mixer, um, yeah. which is, yes, a USB device to an Arduino that does uh, PWM to control like six channels of LEDs. Um, so there's a plugin for that. So you could go either via USB or you could just uh, write a plugin that does, so it spits out UDP packets yeah. for it. Uh, if you would like to contribute that, that would be fantastic. Uh, so one of the problems that we have with the Pi is that um, you can't control you know, very, very large numbers of uh, pixels just because of the time it takes to get all that data out on the line. Okay? Um, yeah, just to, I guess, make an extra point for that, something I've been looking at um, previously um, for my own personal use was building a ArtNet to DMX 512 converter out of an Arduino. Um, so if you, if, if, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but based on what I'm seeing here, this would be able to provide the translation to the ArtNet. You could put the ArtNet receiver on the Arduino. Uh, this would then be able to detect it, and then you could use that to control your lighting strip. Would, would that actually, be correct? I would actually say that if you wanted to convert one to the other, you'd be better off running this software on a high. Um, well, if, you, if you've you already got the Arduino and you're trying to implement something that the Arduino can receive, Yeah, I think they, I haven't seen code. I know of people who have done uh, ArtNet receive on I've, Arduinos. I've, I've seen it. I've almost, been implement, almost finished implementing it. Okay. Yeah, I guess the, the only catch is, is that uh, everyone goes and re-implements their own. Uh, and then, you know, eventually one day your device gets plugged into a network. Uh, and then you find like an odd combination that, that falls over. Um, so our ArtNet stack's been around for 10 years. We've tested it with all sorts of manufacturers' equipment. Uh, and there's like various like, Odd, odd occurrences. Uh, particularly, there's three versions of ArtNet uh, as they try to scale the protocol, which is just broadcast uh, UDP in the first place. Um, and so they, they try to scale this, and there's odd situations you can arrive at uh, where you, know, you try and switch into the, the sort of scaling mode. Um, but yes, if you want something to just sort of like plug in and work that has been tested against a bunch of stuff, this is, this is probably it rather than writing your own. Anyone else? Are we out of time? All right. Okay. All right. Thanks.